Good evening and welcome to Alcasan's annual public meeting. My name is Michelle Bies. I am the Director of Environmental Compliance and I also would like to welcome you on behalf of Alcasan's Executive Director, Arletta Scott Williams, and Alcasan's Board of Directors, and all of Alcasan's employees. We want to thank you for logging into our virtual meeting. And we are hopeful that you will learn about Alcasan's progress on the implementation of the Clean Water Plan, as well as proposed uh, schedule revisions. Before we dive into the details, I want to give a brief background on Alcasan's uh, on Alcasan and key reasons for the Clean Water Plan and why it's important for our region's waterways. As you may know, <clears throat> as you may know, Alcasan is an authority of Allegheny County. We are the Allegheny County Sanitary Authority. Alcasan owns and maintains underground infrastructure that transports wastewater to a large wastewater treatment plant. This treatment plant cleans the dirty water and disinfects it and returns it to the Ohio River at 250 million gallons per day. Alcasan serves the, waste, the wastewater needs for the city of Pittsburgh and 83 surrounding com communities. I'm sorry, that's 82, including the city of Pittsburgh. Okay, so the uh, Alcasan's conveyance and treatment system works efficiently and effectively and meets permit compliance standards. However, when it rains, the pipes in the system are overloaded with rainwater that combines with wastewater and exits the system without treatment or disinfection, as shown in this figure. The overflow is referred to as a combined sewer overflow or a sanitary sewer overflow and can be in the range of 9 billion gallons per year which impair the quality of the water. The Federal Environmental Protection Agency and the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection established standards and other statutes which authorize the protection of surface water quality. These standards are in place to protect the public recreational uses for the waterways, such as boating, fishing, water contact sports, and recreational aesthetics. The federal EPA and the state DEP and our local county health department, along with Alcasan, agreed upon and endorsed the Clean Water Plan, which has the same goals of meeting water quality standards and protecting the public recreational uses for the Allegheny, Ohio, Monongahela Rivers, and several smaller water bodies. The billions of gallons of combined and sanitary sewer overflows, which exit the system without treatment, during rain currently do not meet these water quality standards. The path to compliance, along with the goal of protecting the water quality in the region is channeled by the implementation of the Clean Water Plan. The Clean Water Plan's compliance measures are built to be adaptable in phases so that it is an affordable plan for the region. Today, we will provide an update on the progress of major components of the Clean Water Plan. These are broken into four pillars, four pieces, which we call pillars. These pillars are the foundation of the Clean Water Plan. In addition, we will provide information on a proposed schedule revision, which will be explained during the fourth pillar of the treatment plant expansion. The speakers today have, an important, have important updates and also provide a look ahead for future projects. The presenters are well known in our communities due to the collaborative approach of working with our customer municipalities and stakeholders. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing them. The first speaker will be Julia Spiker. She is the manager of regionalization and she will speak on behalf of our regionalization program. Tim Prevost, the manager of wet weather programs will speak on behalf of grow and source control. Sean McWilliams, he's the tunnel program manager We'll talk today about the regional tunnel system. Jeff Ardros, the manager of capital projects, will speak on behalf of the treatment plant expansion. And he will also be explaining the schedule revision that we want to share with you today. Then we will wrap up with the director of engineering and construction, Kim Kennedy. She will provide the session for questions and answers and also provide some um, future um, program updates. Tomorrow, we begin a 30-day comment period for the proposed schedule revisions that you'll hear today. Again, this revision will be explained during the treatment plan expansion, the fourth pillar by Jeff Ardress. 
Before I turn it over to Julia Spiker, I want to encourage you to add questions to the chat function if you're watching by YouTube or the Q&A function if you're watching by Zoom. And now I will turn it over to Julia Spiker. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you all at home for giving us your time to hear about these interesting and important projects. The regionalization program is a pillar of the clean water plan that's committed to improving the existing infrastructure. Later in this, tonight's presentation, you'll hear about important new infrastructure that's being built. Regionalization is the process in which we move certain sewers over to Alcasan's ownership and responsibility to improve that infrastructure. The service area includes 83 different customer municipalities and expands over 300 square miles. That system includes both combined and separate sewers. When the original Alcasan system was built, it followed along our three rivers and picked up Sawmill Run and Chartiers in our South Hills. The original Alcasan system included these large diameter, deeper sewers and the treatment plant where all of our sewage is conveyed for treatment. Regionalization involves the voluntary transfer of certain sewers to Alcasan's ownership. It is a requirement of our CD that we make a good faith effort to transfer 200 miles of sewers from the municipalities to Alcasan. To undertake this effort, we entered into stakeholder engagement to determine what criteria would apply to those sewers. Working with key collaborators, key stakeholders in the region, we determined that any sewer that was 10 inches in diameter or larger and conveyed flow from more than one municipality would be eligible to transfer. Applying that criteria to the sewers meant the 265 miles of sewers were eligible for, for transfer. And um, along with that were the, the thousands of manholes, regulators, which are the point where the municipal systems connect to Alcasan, and the flow is either conveyed to us for treatment or can tip over to relieve itself in wet weather. In addition, eight different facility structures are eligible for transfer as well. They include four pump stations and four equalization basins, which is where flow is held back during periods of wet weather and then later slowly released to the system to help prevent or reduce those overflows. With the completion of regionalization, this is what the Alcasan system could look like. All of the gray lines you're seeing are the sewers that met the criteria for transfer, as well as those facilities I just mentioned. This is a significant undertaking for Alcasan and our municipal partners, and would more than triple the existing conveyance system that Alcasan owns. This process involves essential, um, robust coordination with our customer municipalities, from the beginning steps of presenting this concept to the municipal managers, to their councils, explaining to them the, the program and how it would work, passing those resolutions. We then move through addressing certain defects that needed to be corrected prior to those sewers coming to Alcasan. We then engage in a record review to look at the historical documents that are related to those sewers that Alcasan needs to, say, to take responsibility for, including permits. The system is currently at, through this collaboration, 47 different municipalities that have signed on for the program. It's spread across our service area representing municipal partners of varying system types, age of the sewers, and diameters of those sewers. Currently, 25 miles of sewers have completely transferred to Alcasan. Anything you see on this map that's shaded in pink is ones that have completed the process and are now Alcasan's responsibility. Those shown in orange are in the final step of transfer where we work out those permitting issues and assume the different responsibilities. Last year at this time, we had 12 miles of sewer that were fully transferred. Over the past year, we've more than doubled that and are currently at 25 miles. We have another 26 that are in the final step and we feel confident that over the next year, we will be able to get those fully transferred. In total, 139 miles will be coming over from the municipalities to Alcasan. Transfer is just the first step of regionalization. What this program really allows us to do is go back into those municipal neighborhoods, invest in the sewers, and invest smart, cost-effective projects that will dynamically address the problems across the sewer shed, absent of those jurisdictional boundaries. We've begun doing this with the sewers that have already come over, and moving forward, we will continue to work with our municipal partners to make smart investments into this regional system. 
If you have any questions about the regionalization program, I would encourage you to put those in the comment or chat functions. And with that, I will turn it over to Tim Prevost. He will talk to you about the GROW program. Thank you, Julia. Uh, today, I would like to provide an update on the green revitalization of our waterways program, which we also call GROW. Uh, for anybody who is unaware uh, what GROW is, in 2016, Alcasan uh, established the GROW program to provide financial and technical uh, resources to our customer municipalities and municipal sewer authorities within the Alcasan service area to implement source reduction projects in anticipation of regulatory requirements for the municipalities. And so the projects that GROW works on, uh, they are proven to be effective. And I'll, we'll get to that a little bit later in the presentation. Well, we're running through a few of the projects that we have funded. And through the eight cycles of the GROW program, over two thirds of Alcasan's customer municipalities were offered at least one award for the for a GROW project. And I'd like to run through what the GROW projects are. We have several project types. First, green stormwater infrastructure. This is a way to hold water in a combined system and slowly releasing it back into the combined system after the rain event has ended. It tries to mimic nature in some ways, and sometimes it doesn't have to go back into the combined sewer. It can infiltrate back into the ground. Influent infiltration reduction is technology pretty much exclusive for sanitary sewer systems, which make up roughly three fourths of our service area. Before Alcasan was built, a lot of streams were conveyed through municipalities to the rivers and also uh, sewers were then connected to those, uh, to those uh, pipes. When Alcasan came in, we were capturing these streams. Uh, direct stream inflow removal is a way to remove the stream, all of its water volume, and also the debris that goes along with it, which impacts the operation and maintenance of our system. Sewer separation is a technology uh, for combined sewer systems, where you take a combined sewer, which has storm sewage and storm sewer and sanitary sewage in one pipe and splitting them up. And this is a very uh, effective technology to removing overflows. And finally, a fifth technology system optimization where a project has a direct impact on overflows. This table that you see shows the breakout of these five technologies. Um, we have 160 projects that have been offered awards. The Alcasan investment for these 160 projects is over $60 million. And the municipal match is, is a little bit less than that, but roughly almost 50-50. When we analyze these projects, we look at stormwater removal or groundwater removal, taking the water out of the system. And we also look at overflow reduction, which is the primary goal of the GROW program. As you can see, when we, are in tip, when we analyze these, we anticipated that almost a billion gallons of uh, water was going to be removed from the system and over 200 million gallons of overflow reduction for these 160 projects. And as you can see on this map, the distribution of the projects is pretty much all over Allegheny County or all over the Alcasan service area. And how do we get there? It's through collaboration. Alcasan works with our customer municipalities to try and identify where the strong projects are that can get the most water out of the system and also reduce the overflows in the most cost-effective manner. And the ways that we do that is through collaborating with our municipalities by offering them resources. One of the first resources that we were able to offer to the municipalities was a report that we uh, released in 2020 called Controlling the Source. It laid out a process to identify source control projects. 
a way to prioritize these opportunities. And then we also showed them where the overflow reduction efficiencies, meaning that if you were able to take the water out, it would have a direct impact on overflow reduction. We also shared a GSI, a green infrastructure constraint analysis to show where the, where the locations could uh, be best suited for green infrastructure. We have an interactive online map, which if you click on the uh, Q code, you'll be able to pull up the uh, report and the map. But most importantly, we identified over 50 potential project opportunities for the municipalities to utilize. Alcsan also offers flow monitoring and flow isolation studies uh, resources to municipalities. Uh, we have performed this in many uh, sewer sheds throughout the Alcsan service area, and we have provided this information back to the municipality at no charge, and they utilize this information to develop their grow projects. We go through site selection and evaluations, dry weather flow analysis, wet weather flow analysis, and also flow isolation investigations to pinpoint where the uh, leakiest sewers are. And then we have municipal workshops, and these are very effective in vetting potential projects with the municipalities. We sit down, we go through the project, we try to find out what this project is going to do, we review the data, we identify any additional information that will help us determine whether or not this project can get a little bit stronger. We also offer uh, suggestions to improve the project. And finally, uh, you know, our schedule. Alcasan's GROW program is, has always been an annual program. So if you're, in the, if you're in a cycle and we're currently in cycle nine, you would, uh, you would go through the process and then in September we offer the awards and then the next cycle begins. Currently we're in the developing the application stage. But understanding the needs of our municipalities, we moved the cycles from an annual to a semi-annual cycle. And right now, not only are the municipalities developing their applications for cycle nine, we're currently uh, doing municipal workshops for cycle 10. None of this is really going to matter unless we can show the results. And that is a unique thing when we developed uh, the GROW program to ensure that we can prove that the investment that Alcasan's making in the municipalities is worth it. Some of the things that we provide to the municipalities is guidance on how to do the monitoring. Pre-application data is providing the basis of what the GROW match is going to be but it's the post-construction data that is going to justify that investment. Currently, out of the 160 projects that we have uh, awarded, 93 of those projects are completed. The bar graph shows the distribution of the different types of projects that we've received final reports on. And when we receive a final report, we do go through and review these final reports thoroughly. The first step is just reviewing and assessing the performance of the monitoring data, making sure that everything is uh, looking good, is uh, matching up fairly well, or it's doing what we expect. Evaluating the project perform the performance monitoring data uh, with the original model to see if the project is has done what we were expecting it to do. And then finally, after we take a look at all these uh, reports, we compile that and we report on the performance of these completed projects. And when it's applicable and the impact is, is great enough, those GROW projects are incorporated into Alcasan's clean water plan model. So for these 93 projects, uh, we see the breakout again of the five different project types. Alcasan's GROW uh, offer is shown as Alcasan GROW Award. So 20, over $21 million for these 93 projects were offered. The municipal uh, match for those projects was 19.2 million. What we anticipated was 587 million gallons a year for these projects. What we found from the monitor data was over a billion gallons of, the water, of water being removed from these projects. And based on that post-construction monitoring data, 
we've estimated that the overflow reduction is 185 million gallons a year. So what's a billion gallons? So we're going to show you what a billion gallons could look like. Let's take Acrisure Stadium and let's fill it up with water to the 100 level. One Acrisure is 42 million gallons. A billion gallons is 24 Acrisures. But that's all very nice. But let's show real results. Back in April, we received a large amount of rain. What you're looking at on the screen is Whiteman Park in Squirrel Hill. Very nice park. It's green infrastructure. And after the rains, it did its job. It filled up. The tanks underneath filled up. It held the water where it was supposed to be held. Not in the street, not in basements, but in the green infrastructure that Oxan helped to fund. If you have any questions on the GROW program, please put them in the Q&A on Zoom or chat in YouTube. I'd like to turn it over now, Sean McWilliams for the Regional Tunnel System. Okay. Thank you, Tim. I'd like to give you an update today on where we stand with the regional tunnel system. The design of the regional tunnel system will be to pick up combined sewer flows, overflows from various pickup points throughout our system. In all, there'll be 16 and a half miles of new tunnels constructed and the amount of overflow reduction that'll be seen at the end of this Construction project in 2036 will be approximately 7 billion gallons in overflow reduction. In all, there'll be three main tunnel segments shown on the map here in green for the Ohio River Tunnel, in blue for the Allegheny River Tunnel, orange for the Monongahela River Tunnel, and then a key component of this system will be the new wet weather pump station constructed here at the wastewater treatment plant. The first projects that will be completed will be the Ohio River Tunnel and the wet weather pump station. In all for the tunnel program, there'll be 31 shafts constructed, which will help to pick up flow from the surface, direct them into structures such as regulators and drop shafts, and convey them to the elevation of the new tunnel system, approximately 150 feet below ground. This image here gives you an idea of the arrangement for the new tunnel system, as it will be constructed in parallel to the existing infrastructure that Alpha Sand currently operates. Of the 90 miles of interceptor that Alpha Sand currently owns and operates, approximately 30 miles of that interceptor, which we call the deep tunnel interceptor, was constructed in rock in similar tunneling method, methods in the 1950s. This system will remain in place and in operation while the new system is built and operates. New regulators will be constructed downstream or upstream of existing outfall regulator points, depending on the alignment and then direct it into drop shaft structures as seen here to where they'll drop down to the tunnel elevation. This imagery gives you an idea of what the inside finished product of the tunnels will look like. On the left is a 18 foot diameter tunnel constructed by a tunnel boring machine. And you can see the precast concrete lining that's left in place. The image on the right gives you an idea of some of the work that's done during the process of construction with temporary utilities. These images here show you the shaft sites that will be constructed similar to our project. The key component here to keep in mind is that the majority of work that is, that is done and will be seen by the communities will be, will be at these locations, such as the launch shaft shown on the left. From this point, we will have materials that will enter the, the shaft for tunnel construction and materials that are the result of the tunneling that will come out of the shaft. This will also be where we have materials stored on site and from where 
materials will be, be leaving the site. The image on the right shows you what a typical shaft construction at the bottom looks like and from where the TBM or tunnel boring machine will launch. Pittsburgh hasn't seen a tunnel boring machine since the construction of the North Shore connector in the early mid 2000s. The image on the left shows you a tunnel boring machine of similar construction that we anticipate for these projects. The diameter of this machine will be approximately 20 to 21 foot in diameter and with all the trailing gear be approximately 300 feet in length. The image on the right gives you an idea of some of the ancillary work that has to occur behind the tunnel boring machine within the tunnel as it's constructed. This includes the uh, erection of temporary utilities as well as ventilation and conveyance back to the surface. A component of the program will be construction of near surface facilities. We term these structures near surface facilities because they're much near the surface than the tunnels themselves. In most cases, they will be touching the surface, but they could still be at depths of 30 to 40 feet. These include regulators, as well as consolidation sewers and shafts. These are all components of conveying flow from the near surface uh, collection and conveyance sewers to the shafts where they drop into the new tunnel system. Lastly, the bottom image on the uh, screen shows you what a finished shaft construction site could look like. And you can see that it's restored to a state that looks very much like a park or usable space and little notice of the construction work that was done there. This is how Alcasan will maintain the system at locations like this and we'll also be able to um, share a nice site when construction is completed. This graphic gives you an idea of the overall tunnel program um, timeline, showing you where we are today. As you can see, there are several projects currently in design, including the wet weather pump station, the Ohio River Tunnel Project, and a smaller near surface project part of the Allegheny River Tunnel, termed Near Surface Package 6. These are all in construction currently, and the first two that will go are in design currently, and the, uh, the first two that will move to construction will be the Ohio River Tunnel, followed by the Wet Weather Pump Station. These two projects will be completed in about the same time frame, which is key because the pump station and Ohio River Tunnel have to come online together in order for the rest of the tunnel system to be put into operation. As mentioned before, the sequence of the projects will be Ohio River Tunnel, followed by Allegheny River Tunnel, followed by Monongahela River Tunnel, as shown on this timeline. As we zoom in to the site for the Ohio River Tunnel, you can see that it, uh, that it comes across Pittsburgh's north side and follows along the alignment of the river, denoted by the dashed green line here. There are several sites, the near surface sites with shafts that will be constructed with uh, six located within the city of Pittsburgh and two in McKees Roxborough. There'll be two river crossing tunnels that are part of the Ohio River Tunnel Project. Those are the Sawmill Run Tunnel, and the Chartiers Creek Tunnel, which are both 14 foot in finished diameter. The main Ohio River Tunnel is 18 foot in finished diameter. On the right side of the map, you can see a site marked AS1. This is a key site for the tunnel program. Alpacan acquired property at this location, which will serve as the launch shaft for the Ohio River Tunnel and also the Allegheny River Tunnel and will be the receiving shaft for the Monongahela River Tunnel. This will be the most long-term site for the project. We encourage you to check in to the Alcasan website and look at the Regional Tunnel System web pages. We will be updating these pages as we progress through the design and into construction, and we will make information available as to the progress of the project. 
In the near future, we will be posting an animated tour of the Ohio River Tunnel. You'll be able to see the current tunnel alignment along the surface as it's planned to be constructed, as well as a rendering of what this will look like under the surface, showing in more detail how our facilities at the surface will connect to the new tunnel system. This timeline for the Ohio River Tunnel gives you an idea where we've come from, from the inception of the design. At this point, we had to pick up the preliminary planning that had been done and also start to acquire properties and key locations for the pro project. As we move through 2022, we reached the 30% design milestone, followed by the 60% in 2023. We're currently reviewing the 2020 or the 90% design deliverable, and we're moving into construction as we go into 2025. Some of the images shown here give you an idea of the early and current field work that's been completed, which includes core sampling, as well as demolition and site preparation at some of the sites. Along with our open house efforts, we've also had community outreach and public meetings to inform the communities about the impacts and what this project will look like in their community. This is a little more detailed timeline for the Ohio River Tunnel, showing you dates that we've reached certain milestones. As mentioned, we're currently reviewing the 90% design, which was just delivered at the end of May. We look to complete the Ohio River Tunnel design later this year and go out to bid towards the beginning of, or end of this year, beginning of next year. Construction will begin in 2025 and be completed by the end of 2029 when it is placed into operation. Another component, which is actually part of the plan expansion, but key to the tunnel program is the wet weather pump station. These renderings here give you an idea of the general layout and construction for what this facility will look like. This component of the tunnel is what will be conveying flows from the tunnel into the current wastewater treatment plant at a flow rate of 120 million gallons per day, which is key to reaching the 600 million gallon per day milestone. This pump station will be at the same depth as the tunnel, approximately 150 feet one completed, and the diameter for this new facility will be approximately 110 feet in diameter. We appreciate you joining us today, and we encourage you that if you have questions or comments, to add those to the chat or Q&A functions on your platform. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Jeff Ardress to talk about the plan expansion update. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. We'll begin today's plant expansion progress update at the exact same place that Sean left off. It's at the southwest corner of our treatment plant, as you can see from this drone image. We've got a couple of red arrows pointing out a couple different things. The bottom arrow is pointing to that future location of the wet weather pump station. As you can see, there are some existing facilities there. We are in the process of decommissioning a substation for demolition to be prepared for that construction of the wet weather pump station within the next couple or next year or so. The other red arrow is pointing right across the street to our existing main pump station, that beautiful red circle building. And this is where all of the interceptors discharge the, the sewer, the sewage from our system. And it's the beginning of our treatment plant process. If you've been out to an Alcasan treatment plant tour, you have very likely been inside of this building. This is the lowest point in Allegheny County. And you've likely been able to look down into our wet well at the sewage coming into our treatment plant. I always like to begin plant expansion updates with an image like this. What this shows are the different packages, the nine different packages that make up the plant expansion program. 
Now, a couple of those packages, package three and seven have multiple projects. So we've got nine packages, 12 projects. And as you can see, our 59 acre treatment plant, there isn't really a corner that is not being touched by construction from 2020 through 2029. So we have to get creative in how we pull this plant expansion program off. The other thing I wanna highlight is the legend at the bottom. That gives the different icons that's associated with each of the projects, whether they are on schedule, ahead of schedule, delayed, or complete. Now, the other thing I want to highlight before moving on from this slide is what is the ultimate goal of the plan expansion program? It's worth noting every time I speak about the plan expansion, what is the ultimate goal? Currently, we have a peak treatment capacity of 250 million gallons per day. The two different goals that we are trying to attain is reaching 295 million gallons per day of full secondary treatment, that's full treatment capacity through our plant, and ultimately increasing our wet weather treatment capacity to 600 million gallons per day by the end of the program. Now, wet weather treatment capacity, what is it? That is, that is flows that will receive primary treatment, it will bypass the secondary treatment process, and it will receive disinfection before being discharged to the Ohio River. Now, three of these tech boxes are gonna turn yellow. Package one, the North End Plan Expansion. Package four, the CSO Bypass and Disinfection Project. Package five, the East Headworks. Those three projects I will be providing construction progress updates on this evening. And this next slide is a simplified version of that last slide. These two projects, package one, the North End Plan Expansion, and package four, the CSO bypass and disinfection. These are the subject of the proposed schedule revisions that we are discussing tonight. So I like to call this slide the plant expansions report card because any of our 12 projects could be in any of four different phases. They could be not started, they could be under design, they could be under construction, or they could be complete. I'm happy to report that none of our 12 projects have not started. Every project has started at this point. I'm also happy to report that that design status column is showing that nine of our 12 projects have completed design, which means they are either under construction or complete. The other thing I wanna highlight is package six, the solid thickening and dewatering improvements. Now, please look at the note in the construction status. It will bid in Q3 of 2024. That is correct that we are going to be bidding package six in the next couple months which will only leave two projects, the primary sedimentation tanks and the wet weather pump station in the, in the design status. At that point, all projects beyond those two will be in construction or complete. Now this slide is showing the financials of the plant expansion program. And really the two most important things to highlight on this slide are boxed in red at the bottom. Now on the bottom left, there's, you'll see the $340 million boxed. Those are actual dollars committed to construction projects for the plant expansion program. 340 million. That's a huge, huge credit to everything that's been going on at the plant. Additionally, at the bottom right, we've just passed the $250 million threshold of value of work completed. So of that 340 million we've committed, we've spent 250 million for completed work. That's a quarter of a billion dollars. That is, that is a heavy credit to what is going on. And calling back to what I said on the previous slide, package six, the solid thickening and dewatering improvements, another project that's going to be entering construction in the next several months, that will tick that bottom left number over the $350 million threshold as well. So I'll start our construction progress updates with our East Headworks project. If you've been to an open house anytime since 2021, you have very likely seen this construction site if you came to the back of open house. Now, going back to 2021, it was a fairly flat lot during open house. 2022, it was a deep hole about 20 feet deep. 2023, we had just placed our last structural steel beam. And now here we are in 2024, and it's really looking like a finished building. And as our drone turns to the north side of the East Headworks building, what you're seeing at the bottom of your screen are our six future grip tanks associated with the East Headworks. And that leads me to want to describe what happens within the East Headworks. 
A head works is where preliminary treatment occurs. Preliminary treatment is the first process at our wastewater treatment facility. It is where we screen out and take out the large and heavy inorganic materials to really protect the mechanical equipment later on in our treatment processes. So these next couple slides, because our building's looking great on the outside, we wanna take you inside to see what they look like. So we'll start in our screenings room. And what you're seeing on the left side of your screen are six bar screens, very large. And this is where the 360 million gallons per day of flow going through the East Headworks will receive that first process, treatment process of screening to get out the large material. And then to the left of your screen, right on the other side of that wall is our grit handling room. And that's the room that we're flying over right now. You're seeing six grit classifiers with 12 hydrocyclones sitting atop them. So this relates to the grit tanks right outside the building. What happens in those grit tanks is that we send air into the grit tanks to, to let the inorganic material like rocks settle out to the bottom. Those rocks and that grit is then pumped up to these classifiers and it's discharged by these classifiers onto the conveyor belts, which you can kind of see on the, on the right side of the screen. We don't quite have the belt in yet, but ultimately the grit is deposited onto that conveyor belt. The conveyor belt will then convey it to the garage at the other end of this building to be hauled out of the facility. Now, one thing we obviously like to do at annual public meetings is highlight milestones that we've hit in the past year or upcoming. Now, obviously this building is starting to really look like a building. And so I'm happy to report that we are on track to activate this East Headworks facility in the next several months by late summer, 2024. A great milestone that's a credit to what is going on here. So what we're looking at here, again, is a repeat of the slide, reminding everybody of the two projects that are subject to the proposed schedule revisions being discussed tonight. First is package one, the North End plant expansion. This is related to our increase in secondary treatment capacity to 295 million gallons per day. Second is package four, the CSO bypass and disinfection project. This is tied to our increase in wet weather treatment capacity to 480 million gallons per day. And this next slide does a much better job of showing what I've just described, but really to start out, I wanna focus on that middle column because currently both of these plant increase to our capacity are tied to the end of 2025. Our current place and operation date for increasing to 295 million gallons per day secondary treatment is December 31st. The second increase of increasing to 480 million gallons per day of wet weather treatment is tied to December 30th, 2025. We are proposing two scheduled revisions tonight. First, the 295 million gallons per day of secondary treatment, we are proposing for it to be three months earlier than December 31st, 2025 to a new date of October 3rd, 2025. Second, the 480 million gallon per day wet weather treatment increase, we are proposing to postpone from the end of 2025 to nine months later, October 2nd, 2026. With these proposed schedule revisions, Alpacent is still committed to meeting the overall obligations of our modified consent decree. So I'll start out with a North End plant expansion construction progress update. First thing you'll notice is the river wall that was constructed along the river to essentially build this construction site back in 2021. You'll also notice 16 circular final settling tanks. You'll notice the beginning of another one and then a blank circle where a, a final 18th will be built. So overall, after the North End plant expansion, we will have a total of 18. You'll also notice a concrete artery cutting right through the clarifiers. What that is, is a secondary effluent conduit extension that has been built over the last year and a half that will ultimately convey secondary treated flows to the new disinfection tank that you're seeing at the bottom of your screen. The tank that you're seeing at the bottom of your screen, that will become our daily 24 seven, 365 days a year, final disinfection tank for our secondary treated flows. And the next slide shows a better angle from the river 
to show where those flows ultimately end up. So the, the image on the right, we've got four different arrows. The top right is pointing to that secondary effluent conduit extension, giving a little bit more description to where the flows are coming into the disinfection tank. They will enter the disinfection tank. With any disinfection tank, you need a building for the chemicals to be stored. That is the chemical building that you're seeing to the left uh, that, that we're very close to, to activating. And then ultimately, once those flows have gone through the final disinfection process, they will be discharged out the outfall that you see at the bottom of your slide. Now, I'm happy to report that these four items are on track to be in service by early next year. However, these are not the only facilities that are needed to increase our secondary treatment capacity to 295 million gallons per day. Those are the two circular final settling tanks that I was alluding to that will increase our, our, our number of final settling tanks from 16 to 18. So on the left, you can see our final settling tank EFS time. You can see that we're about 80% complete with that tank. Now, WFS9, there really hasn't been anything started on that one yet. That will be the priority over the next year. But I am happy to report that ultimately all of this is on track. In fact, we're not only on track, we're ahead of schedule to activate this entire system ahead of our current place in operation date of end of 2025. So our first revision is to turn this system on in October of 2025, increasing our plant's secondary treatment full capacity to 295 million gallons per day by October of 2025. Our next and final construction progress update, the CSO bypass and disinfection project. These are two different angles showing the construction site. It's a fairly large construction site right in the heart of our wastewater treatment plant. On the left, you're facing east from right above the river. On the right, you are facing north from right above our primary sedimentation tanks. We'll focus in on the left photo. And I wanna start out by discussing what has occurred on this project to date. And I wanna start with the image on the bottom. Now, if you go to a historical image on Google Earth or, or Bing or something like that, you will see that just last year, there was a building where this construction is occurring. The, one of the first activities with this project was demolishing a building to clear space for what you are seeing on the bottom right. And what you are seeing on the bottom right is the beginning of the foundation for our future chemical building that is going to be associated with the bypass disinfection tank. In fact, I believe we're on track to pour the concrete for that foundation tomorrow. Now let's talk about the top right photo. And to really understand what you're looking at here, I need to take a step back and explain where we are in the plant. In that image on the right, those are our primary sedimentation tanks. Those were constructed in the 1950s and the 1960s when the original Alcacin wastewater treatment plant was constructed. On the left, are our, 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 our aeration tanks. That is the beginning of the secondary treatment process. That was built in the 1970s when secondary treatment was added to Alcosan's wastewater treatment plant. So this is an area that really doesn't get dug up very often. In fact, it, it's really remained untouched for the last 50 plus years. But what we are seeing here, we have connection points between our primary treatment and our secondary treatment. And we've got eight different independent connection points that we call flow regulating chambers. And what you can see in the top right photo is the demolition of the first one. And if you look really closely at the wall on the left side of the photo, you can see the circle where the pipe was conveying the flow from primary treatment to secondary treatment. This is extremely, extremely difficult construction. It's also happening, as I said, right in the heart of the plant between primary treatment and secondary treatment. And no matter what at the plant, the priority number one is always to remain operational. Alcosan's wastewater treatment plant operates 24-7, 365 days a year, and we do not have the capability to take this offline to make construction any easier. So priority number one at all times is to maintain operation of the plant, but also protecting the existing structures. And as I said, we're building next to structures that are 50 to 70 years old. So we talked about what has occurred to date, what is still to occur on this project. So the third red arrow is explaining that 
what that is pointing to is an existing final disinfection tank. And if you remember, I said at the north end, we're building a new one. So what happens when that north end final disinfection tank goes operational early next year? What will happen is that this tank will be taken offline. It'll be dried out and it will be ultimately reconfigured to become our bypass disinfection tank. Once that is reconfigured and the flow regulating chambers are complete with their construction, that is when we will be able to increase our wet weather treatment capacity to 480 million gallons per day. And I think this slide does the best, gives the best way to describe the difference between full secondary treatment and wet weather treatment. Where we are building the flow regulating chambers, that is the split between the two, the two trains of flow. Secondary treatment, treatment will continue left across the page in, into, into secondary treatment. The wet weather treatment will bypass secondary treatment, go towards the river, and then cut along the river into this reconfigured bypass disinfection tank. So the second proposed schedule revision due to some challenges that we've had on this project associated with what I've described, is postponing the wet weather treatment capacity increase to, two, to 480 million gallons per day from the end of 2025 to early October 2026. So I've described the details of the projects and the impacts to these two milestones, but overall, what does it mean? And I, I want to take a step back because I think the first thing to discuss is the 250 million gallons per day. I've explained that that is our current peak treatment capacity, but it's important to note that that isn't the flow that we see day to day at Alcasan. The average daily flow at Alcasan is anywhere from 190 to 200 million gallons per day. So where does this 250 million gallons per day come in? When wet weather impacts our plant through a rain event or a snow melt, that is when we will see increased flows at the plant. And that is where we will run up against our 250 million gall gallon per day limit. Thus the beginning of overflows in the system. So what does the increase to 295 three months early really mean? Well, what that means is we are going to be able to increase that ceiling of treatment at our treatment plant by 45 million gallons per day, three months earlier during a potentially wet season. What that will do is we will see three additional months earlier of reduced sewer overflow volumes, frequencies, and durations. So what is the difference between 295 million gallons per day of set full secondary treatment and 480 million gallons per day of wet weather treatment? The 295 million gallons per day capacity, that will be enough to handle the smaller and more frequent run-of-the-mill wet weather rain events. It's the more extreme long-term where we're getting hammered with a rain event that will, that will push us over that 295 million gallon per day limit. So what you're seeing in this table on the right, based on preliminary model results, this 295 million gallon per day increase, it actually results over a typical year, almost twice, it, it's handling over twice the additional overflow volume than that 480 million gallons per day because of that run of the mill rain event versus the more extreme rain events. If you have any questions associated with the plant expansion program or the proposed schedule revisions, please put them in Zoom or YouTube. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Kim Kennedy, our Director of Engineering and Construction. All right, uh, I will um, be taking us to the conclusion of our public meeting tonight. Now that Jeff has talked to you about this schedule revision, what's next? Well, today starts a 30-day public comment period. There are a couple of options for submitting comments to Alcasan. You can submit your comment to the email address shown there, which is also on our website. Um, and uh, however, if you're more comfortable, then you can mail the comments to my attention at that address. 
Either way counts, and we will make sure that we respond accordingly. After the 30-day public comment period ends, we will, um, well, first of all, um, very shortly, we will meet with the agencies to talk through the revision similar to the overview that we uh, presented this evening while, the, while we're in that 30-day comment period. At the end of that period, we will formally submit the revisions to the agencies for their review and approval with the comments that we were received. And then the agencies have six months to review and um, provide us with a response to this request. So that is, those are the steps that formalize this um, schedule request with the agencies. And just a couple um, additional slides for tonight. We wanted to preview some of our upcoming events. And the first one is on August 27th. This is our second Ohio River Tunnel contractor outreach event. This will also include updates on the construction project associated with the wet weather pump station. So this is for um, anybody interested in the construction phase of these two projects and specifically small businesses, women and minority owned businesses that want to hear about what opportunities are presented with such a mega project like the ORT and the wet weather pump station, please consider um, attending this event. We're gonna present quite a bit of information. And then the second upcoming event that I wanted to bring your attention to is of course our annual open house. So this year we're uh, hosting the public on September 14th. The East Headworks will be operational. It's going to be a wonderful uh, chance for us to showcase some of the work uh, associated with the plan expansion and then the work that we do each and every day um, to protect the water quality in this region. So outreach event, August 27th, open house, September 14th. So just kind of wrapping it up, um, like Michelle said, these are our four components are four buckets that that show compliance with the clean water plan and our modified consent decree. They're all important. I think that the updates tonight were wonderful um, and we continue to work um, diligently uh, at all four of these components. With that said, we still have the adaptive management provision in our consent decree and we continue to work with our municipalities to use the best available data and ideas to make this the most successful and cost-effective program to get the sewer overflows out of the river and improve the water quality in our region. So we, we do not forget this adaptive management provision. Please, if you are interested in the work that we're doing, follow us on our website, sign up for our newsletter, we do our best um, to update social media. We, uh, like Sean was saying, there's gonna be some great updates on the tunnel program on our website. So please continue to check in. Um, and if you're not seeing something, ask. So with that, I would like to open it up for Q and A. Um, and like everybody has said throughout the evening, um, if you have any questions at all, please put them in um, the chat or the Q&A. Now we did have um, one question that was sent earlier today, um, but before I do that, we, we did have some people who may or may not have wanted to sign up for public comment. Um, they did uh, email, um, email into the public relations at alcasan.org. So I did want to give the opportunity to um, Kim P, if she was present and wanted to um, speak uh, a public comment, Kim P, um, a Jim C, no, and then a Sarah D. Sarah, would you were you interested in um, making a comment? 
Okay. So with that, we had one question and that was, is the clean water plan inclusive of the Chartier Creek Furnace Street extension? And this is actually a project um, that's over in McKees Rocks. The, this is um, actually not an Elkisan project. So this project, even though it is called Chartier's Creek Furnace Street Extension, is actually associated with the um, local CDC. So I would offer that um, you reached out to the local, the borough CDC for more information on that project, but that is not, um, I know that is confusing and it's a good question, but that is not an Elkisan project. So we have people checking the uh, Q&A session um, on both the YouTube and the Zoom. And we'll give it a few minutes to gather your questions and we are here to answer them. So in the Zoom, it's under Q&A, correct? Not the chat, it's Q&A. Okay. So as a reminder, tonight is not the only time to be able to submit a question. You can submit it through the email address um, public.relations at elkistan.org, which was on the slide. And you can also mail them in if you're more comfortable with that approach. And especially a specific to the revisions request, the scheduled request that Jeff went over, that is, um, that'll be open for 30 days, but certainly Elkistan general related questions can be submitted at any time. All right, no questions, well done, and thank you for the information. You're welcome, it was our pleasure. So the presentation will be available. Um, the question is, will the presentation be available on your website and for how long? The presentation will be available on our YouTube channel for eternity. <laughs> so um, I uh, watched our presentation from last year earlier today. So uh, they, 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 don't, they don't go down. Um, I don't know about our website. Is it gonna be on our website? All right. Well, that wraps up our public meeting for 2024. Thank you again for listening. Thank you for 